children use the library all the time. And since January, she's been on the Missoula Public Library Board. Are you having fun? <laughs> Especially as you approach budget time. And Pam is going to read a short story by Shirley Jackson entitled Life Among the Savages. to read and I had a lot of trouble trying to pick out what I was going to read for tonight. Um, I read a lot of children's stories. I came into the library last week trying to decide what I was going to find and Betty Ammons, one of the children's librarians, suggested I look into this collection and um, I found just what I wanted. And I use the library a lot but I don't often ask for help and I wish that I would have approached Karen or Betty sooner. It would have alleviated a lot of my anxiety about what I was going to read. So I encourage you to use the library and also take advantage of the people who work here. They're very knowledgeable and helpful. Um, my oldest son is in kindergarten, and that makes this story especially poignant for me. It was written in 1953 before I was even born, <clears throat> and so it says something about moms and their boys. Um, also, I won't be offended if you fall asleep while I read because I'm used to my listeners falling asleep <laughs> by the end of my stories. <laughs> this is Life Among the Savages. The day Laurie started kindergarten, he renounced corduroy overalls with bibs and began wearing blue jeans with a belt. I watched him go off the first morning with the older girl next door, seeing clearly that an era of my life was ended, my sweet voice nursery school taught replaced by a long-trousered, swaggering character who forgot to stop at the corner and wave goodbye to me. He came home the same way, the front door slamming open, his cap on the floor, and the voice suddenly become raucous, shouting, Isn't anybody here? At lunch, he spoke insolently to his father, spilled Janny's milk, and remarked that his teacher said that we were not to take the name of the Lord in vain. How was school today, I asked, elaborately casual. All right, he said. Did you learn anything, his father asked. Laurie regarded his father coldly. I didn't learn nothing, he said. Anything, I said. Didn't learn anything. The teacher spanked a boy, though, Laurie said, addressing his bread and butter, for being fresh, he added with his mouth full. <coughs> what did he do, I asked. Who was it? Laurie thought. It was Charles, he said. He was fresh. The teacher spanked him and made him stand in the corner. He was really fresh. What did he do, I asked again. But Laurie slid off his chair, took a cookie, and left while his father was still saying, See here, young man. The next day, Laurie remarked at lunch as soon as he sat down, Well, Charles was bad again today. He grinned enormously and said, Today Charles hit the teacher. Good <coughs> heavens, I said, mindful of the Lord's name. I suppose he got spanked again. He sure did, Laurie said. Look up, he said to his father. What? His father said, looking up. Look down, Laurie said. Look at my thumb. Gee, you're dumb. He began to laugh insanely. Why did Charles hit the teacher, I asked quickly. Because she tried to make him color with red crayons, Laurie said. Charles wanted to color with green crayons, so he hit the teacher, and she spanked him and said, nobody play with Charles, but everybody did. The third day, it was Wednesday of the first week, Charles bounced a seesaw onto the head of a little girl and made her bleed, and the teacher made him stay inside all during recess. Thursday, Charles had to stand in a corner during story time because he kept pounding his feet on the floor. Friday, Charles was deprived of blackboard privileges because he threw chalk. On Saturday, I remarked to my husband, Do you think kindergarten is too upsetting for Lori? All this toughness and bad grammar, and this Charles boy sounds like such a bad influence. It'll be all right, my husband said reassuringly. Bound to be people like Charles in the world, might as well meet them now as later. On Monday, Lori came home late, full of news. Charles, he shouted as he came up the hill. I was waiting anxiously on the front steps. Charles, Laura yelled all the way up the hill. Charles was bad again. Come right in, I said as soon as he came close enough. Lunch is waiting. You know what Charles did, he demanded, following me through the door. Charles yelled so in school they sent a boy in from first grade to tell the teacher she had to make Charles keep quiet. And so Charles had to stay after school, and so all the children stayed to watch him. What did he do, I asked. He just sat there, Lori said, climbing into his chair at the table. Hi, Pop, you old dust mop. Charles had to stay after school today, I told my husband. Everyone stayed with him. What does this Charles look like, my husband asked Lori. What's his other name? Well, he's bigger than me, Lori said, and he doesn't have any rubbers, and he doesn't ever wear a jacket. Monday night was the first parent-teacher's meeting, and only the fact that Janny had a cold kept me from going. I wanted passionately to meet Charles's mother. On Tuesday, Lori remarked suddenly, Our teacher had a friend come see her in school today. Charles's mother, my husband and I asked simultaneously. Nah, Laurie said scornfully. It was a man who came and made us do exercises. Look, 
He climbed down from his chair and squatted down and touched his toes. Like this, he said. He got solemnly back into his chair and said, picking up his fork, Charles didn't even do exercises. That's fine, I said heartily. Didn't Charles want to do exercises? Nah, Laurie said. Charles was so fresh to the teacher's friend, he wasn't let do exercises. Fresh again, I said. He kicked the teacher's friend, Laurie said. The teacher's friend told Charles to touch his toes like I just did, and Charles kicked him. What are they going to do about Charles, do you suppose? Laurie's father asked him. Laurie shrugged elaborately. Throw him out of school, I guess, he said. Wednesday and Thursday were routine. Charles yelled during story hour and hit a boy in the stomach and made him cry. On Friday, Charles stayed after school again, and so did all the other children. With the third week of kindergarten, Charles was an institution in our family. Janie was being a Charles when she cried all afternoon. Laurie did a Charles when he filled his wagon full of mud and pulled it through the kitchen. Even my husband, when he caught his elbow in the telephone cord and pulled telephone ashtray and a bowl of flowers off the table, said, after the first minute, looks like Charles. During the third and fourth weeks, there seemed to be a reformation in Charles. Laurie reported grimly at lunch on Thursday of the third week. Charles was so good today, the teacher gave him an apple. What, I said, and my husband added warily, you mean Charles? Charles, Lori said, he gave the crayons around and he picked up the books afterward, and the teacher said he was her helper. What happened, I asked incredulously. He was her helper, that's all, Lori said and shrugged. Can this be true about Charles, I asked my husband that night. Can something like this happen? Wait and see, my husband said cynically. When you've got a Charles to deal with, this may mean he's only plotting. He seemed to be wrong. For over a week, Charles was the teacher's helper. Each day he handed things out and he picked things up. No one had to stay after school. The PTA meeting's next week again, I told my husband one meeting. I'm going to find Charles' mother there. Ask her what happened to Charles, my husband said. I'd like to know. I'd like to know myself, I said. <clears throat> On Friday of that week, things were back to normal. You know what Charles did today, Lori demanded at the lunch table in a voice slightly odd. He told a little girl to say a word. She said it, and the teacher washed her mouth out with soap, and Charles laughed. What word, his father asked unwisely, and Laurie said, I'll have to whisper to you, it's so bad. He got down off his chair and went around to his father. His father bent his head down, and Laurie whispered joyfully. His father's eyes widened. Did Charles tell the little girl to say that, he asked respectfully. She said it twice, Laurie said. Charles told her to say it twice. What happened to Charles, my husband asked. Nothing, Laurie said. He was passing out the crayons. Monday morning, Charles abandoned the little girl and said the evil word himself three or four times getting his mouth washed out with soap each time. He also threw chalk. My husband came to the door with me that evening as I set out for the PTA meeting. Invite her over for a cup of tea after the meeting, he said. I want to get a look at her. If only she's there, I said prayerfully. She'll be there, my husband said. I don't see how they could hold a PTA meeting without Charles's mother. At the meeting, I sat restlessly, scanning each comfortable matronly face, trying to determine which one hid the secret of Charles. None of them looked to me haggard enough. No one stood up in the meeting and apologized for the way her son had been acting. No one mentioned Charles. After the meeting, I identified and sought out Lori's kindergarten teacher. She had a plate with a cup of tea and a piece of chocolate cake. I had a plate with a cup of tea and a piece of marshmallow cake. We maneuvered up to one another cautiously and smiled. I've been so anxious to meet you, I said. I'm Lori's mother. We're all so interested in Lori, she said. Well, he certainly likes kindergarten. I said he talks about it all the time. We had a little trouble adjusting the first week or so, she said primly, but now he's a fine little helper with lapses, of course. Well, Laura usually adjusts very quickly, I said. I suppose this time it's Charles's influence. Charles? Yes, I said, laughing. You must have your hands full in that kindergarten with Charles. Charles, she said, we don't have any Charles in the kindergarten. <laughs> I know Charles well. He's my youngest son. <laughs> and uh, he finally graduated and is raising children of his own. And he calls me now and then and tells me how his two-year-old <laughs> is developing into a Charles. And I, I love to hear it. <laughs> we have a couple writers tonight who are going to read to us. And the next one is, the next reader is Jane Balls, who works with words for a living. She writes articles for national magazines. She has two sons, and I presume you've read Laura Ingalls Wilder to them. I read them to my three sons as well. Um, Jane Balls. I 
I shall sit because well, that's how we read, snuggled up on the sofa in front of the wood stove. And I have uh, also a baby daughter, and so she joins us on the sofa, and we take turns holding her, and I read to her. I was surprised when the, my sons liked the Little House on the Prairie books by Laura Ingalls Wilder. Most of what we'd been reading had been things like Tolkien's Lord of the Rings and, and the Chronicles of Pr Pridane by Lloyd Alexander and Sword and Sorcery and High Adventure. And we started reading these wonderful books about pioneer life and they were absolutely riveted. This is a selection from Farmer Boy, which is the story of the childhood of Almanzo Wilder, who eventually married Laura Ingalls. And it takes place in northern New York State in 1866, at a time when Almanzo is nine, and his sister Alice is 10, and Eliza Jane is 12, and his brother Royal is 13. And in the chapter I'm reading to you called Keeping House, they learn that they have an opportunity to take care of the house and the farm all by themselves for an entire week. And this is the story of what happens. One evening at supper, father said, it's time mother and I had a vacation. We're thinking of spending a week at Uncle Andrew's. Can you children take care of things and behave yourselves while we're gone? I'm sure Eliza Jane and Royal can look after the place for a week, mother said, with Alice and Almanzo to help them. Almanzo looked at Alice, and they both looked at Eliza Jane, and they all looked at Father and said, Yes, Father. Uncle Andrew lived ten miles away. For a week, Father and Mother were getting ready to go, and all the time they were thinking of things that must be done while they were away. Even when Mother was climbing into the buggy, she was talking. Be sure to gather the eggs every night, she said, and I depend on you, Eliza Jane, to take care of the churning. Don't salt the butter too much. Pack it in a small tub and be sure you cover it. Remember not to pick the beans and peas I'm saving for seed. Now you all be good while we're gone. She was tucking her hoops down between the seat and the dashboard. Father spread the lap robe. And mind, Eliza Jane, be careful of fires. Don't you leave the house while there's fire in the cook stove. And don't get to scuffling with lighted candles, whatever you do. And Father tightened the reins and the horses started. Don't eat all the sugar, Mother called back. The buggy turned into the road. The horses began to trot, rapidly taking father and mother away. In a little while, the sound of the buggy wheel ceased. Father and mother were gone. Nobody said anything. Even Eliza Jane looked a little scared. The house and the barns and the fields seemed very big and empty. For a whole week, father and mother would be 10 miles away. Suddenly, Almanzo threw his hat into the air and yelled. Alice hugged herself and cried, what'll we do first? They could do anything they liked. There was nobody to stop them. We'll do the dishes and make the beds, Eliza Jane said, bossy. Let's make ice cream, Royal shouted. Eliza Jane loved ice cream. She hesitated and said, well. Amonzo ran after Royal to the ice house. They dug a block of ice out of the sawdust and put it in a grain sack. They laid the sack on the back porch and pounded it with hatchets till the ice was crushed. Alice came out to watch them while she whipped egg whites on a platter. She beat them with a fork till they were too stiff to slip when she tilted the platter. Eliza Jane measured milk and cream and dipped up sugar from the barrel in the pantry. It was not common maple sugar, but white sugar bought from the store. Mother used it only when company came. Eliza Jane dipped six cupfuls, then she smoothed the sugar that was left, and you would hardly have missed any. She made a big milk pail full of yellow custard, and they set the pail in a tub and packed the snowy crushed ice around it with salt, and they covered it all with a blanket. Every few minutes, they took off the blanket and uncovered the pail and stirred the freezing ice cream. When it was frozen, Alice brought saucers and spoons, and Almanzo brought out a cake and the butcher knife. He cut enormous pieces of cake while Eliza Jane heaped the saucers. They could eat all the ice cream they wanted to. No one would stop them. At noon, they had eaten the whole cake and almost all the ice cream. Eliza Jane said it was time to get dinner, but the others didn't want any dinner. Almanzo said, all I want is a watermelon. Alice jumped up. Goody, let's go get one. Alice, Eliza Jane cried, you come right back here and do the breakfast dishes. I will, Alice called out, when I come back. Alice and Almanzo went into the hot melon field where the melons lay round above their wilting flat leaves. Almanzo snapped his finger against the green rinds and listened. When a mellow sa melon sounded ripe, it was ripe. And when it sounded green, it was green. 
But when Almanzo said a melon sounded ripe, Alice thought it sounded green. There really wasn't any way to know, though Almanzo was sure he knew more about melons than any girl. So in the end, they picked six of the biggest melons, and they lugged them one by one to the ice house and put them on the damp, cold sawdust. Then Alice went to the house to do the dishes. Almanzo said he wasn't going to do anything. Maybe he'd go swimming. But as soon as Alice was out of sight, he skipped through the barns and stole into the pasture where the colts were. The pasture was big and the sun was very hot. The air shimmered and wavered with heat, and little insects made a shrill sound. Bess and Beauty were lying down in the shade of a tree, and their little colts stood near them, waggling their small bushy tails and straddling a little on their long gangling legs. The yearlings and the two-year-olds and the three-year-olds were grazing. All of them lifted their heads and stared at Almanzo. He went slowly toward them, holding out his hand. There wasn't anything in his hand, but they didn't know that. He didn't mean to do anything. He only wanted to get near enough to pet them. Starlight and the other little colt ran wabbling to their mothers, and Bess and Beauty lifted up their heads and looked and then laid them down again. The big colts all pricked up their ears. One big colt stepped toward Almanzo, then another. The six big colts were all coming. Almanzo wished he had brought carrots for them. They were so beautiful and free and big, tossing their manes and showing the whites of their eyes. The sunshine glinted on their strong, arched necks and on the muscles of their chests. Suddenly, one of them said, whoosh. One of them kicked, one of them squealed, and all at once their heads went up, their tails went up, their hooves thundered on the ground. All their brown haunches and high black tails were turned to Almanzo. Like a thundering whirlwind, those six colts went around the tree, and Almanzo heard them behind him. He whirled around. He saw their pounding hooves and big chests coming straight at him. They were running too fast to stop. There wasn't time to get out of the way. Almanzo's eyes shut. He yelled, whoa! The air on the ground shook. His eyes opened. He saw brown knees rising up in the air, and a round belly and hind legs rushed overhead. Brown sides went by him like thunder. His hat flew off. He felt stunned. One of the three-year-olds had jumped over him. The colts were thundering down across the pasture, and Almanzo saw Royal coming. Leave those colts be, Royal shouted. He came up and said that for a cent he'd give Almanzo a licking he'd remember. You know better than to fool with those colts, Royal said. He took Almanzo by the ear. Almanzo trotted, but his ear was pulled all the way to the barns. He said he hadn't done anything. Royal wouldn't listen. Let me catch you in that pasture again, and I'll weigh all the hide off you, Royal said. I'll tell Father, too. Almanzo went away, rubbing his ear. He went down to Trout River and swam in the swimming hole till he felt better. But he thought it wasn't fair that he was the youngest in the family. That afternoon, the melons were cold, and Almanzo carried them to the grass under the balsam tree in the yard. Royal stuck the butcher knife into the dewy green rinds, and every melon was so ripe that the rinds cracked open. Almanzo and Alice and Eliza Jane and Royal bit deep into the juicy cold slices, and they ate till they could eat no more. Almanzo pinched the sleek black seeds, popping them at Eliza Jane until she made him quit. Then he slowly ate the last slice of melon, and he said, I'm going to fetch Lucy to eat up the rinds. You will not do any such a thing, Eliza Jane said. The idea, a dirty old pig in the front yard. She is not either a dirty old pig, said Almanzo. Lucy's a clean, young little pig, and pigs are the cleanest animals there are. You just ought to see the way Lucy keeps her bed clean and turns it and airs it and makes it up every day. Horses won't do that, nor cows, nor sheep, nor anything. Pigs, I guess I know that. I guess I know as much about pigs as you do, Eliza Jane said. Then don't you call Lucy dirty. She's as clean as you be. Well, Mother told you to obey me, Eliza Jane answered, and I'm not going to waste melon rinds on any pig. I'm going to make watermelon rind preserves. I guess they're as much my rinds as they are yours, Almanzo began, but Royal got up and said, Come along, Almanzo, it's chore time. Almanzo said no more, but when the chores were done, he let Lucy out of her pen. The little pig was as white as a lamb, and she liked Almanzo. Her little curled tail quirked whenever she saw him. She followed him to the house, grunting happily, and she squealed for him at the door till Eliza Jane said she couldn't hear herself think. After supper, Almanzo took a plate of scraps and fed them to Lucy. He sat on the back steps and scratched her prickly back. Pigs enjoy that. In the kitchen, Eliza Jane and Royal were arguing about candy. Royal wanted some, but Eliza Jane said the candy pulls were only for winter evenings. Royal said he didn't see why candy wouldn't be just good in the summer. Almanzo thought so, too, and he went in and sided with Royal. Alice said she knew how to make candy. Eliza Jane wouldn't do it, but Alice mixed sugar and molasses and water and boiled them, and then she poured the candy on buttered plaster, platters and set it on the porch to cool. They rolled up their sleeves and buttered their hands, ready to pull it, and Eliza Jane buttered her hands, too. All the time, Lucy was squealing for Almanzo. He went out to see if the candy was cool enough, and he thought his little pig should have some. The candy was cool. No one was watching. 
So he took a big wad of the soft brown candy and dropped it over the edge of the porch into Lucy's wide open mouth. Then they all pulled candy. They pulled it into long strands and doubled the strands and pulled again. Every time they doubled it, they took a bite. It was very sticky. It stuck to their teeth and their fingers and their faces. Somehow it got in their hair and stuck. And when Almanzo dropped some on the floor, it stuck there. It should have become hard and brittle, but it didn't. They pulled and they pulled. Still, it was soft and sticky. Long past bedtime, they gave it up and went to bed. Next morning, when Almanzo started to do the chores, Lucy was standing in the yard. Her tail hung limp and her head hung down. She did not squeal when she saw him. She shook her head sadly and wrinkled her nose. Where her white teeth should have been, there was a smooth brown streak. Lucy's teeth were stuck together with candy. She could not eat. She could not drink. She could not even squeal. She could not grunt. But when she saw Almanzo coming, she ran. Almanzo yelled for Royal. They chased Lucy all around the house, under the snowball bushes and around the lilacs. They chased her all over the garden. Lucy whirled and dodged and ducked and ran like anything. All the time, she didn't make a sound. She couldn't. Her mouth was full of candy. She ran between Royal's legs and upset him. Almanzo almost grabbed her and went sprawling on his nose. She tore through the peas and squashed the ripe tomatoes and uprooted the green round cabbages. Eliza Jane kept telling Royal and Almanzo to catch her. Alice ran after her. At last they cornered her. She dashed around Alice's skirts. Almanzo fell on her and grabbed. She kicked and tore a long hole on the front of his blouse. Almanzo held her down. Alice held her kicking hind legs. Royal pried her mouth open and scraped out the candy. Then how Lucy squealed. She squealed all the squeals that had been in her all night and all the squeals she couldn't squeal while they were chasing her, and she ran screaming to her pen. Almanzo James Wilder, just look at yourself, Eliza Jane scolded. He couldn't, and he didn't want to. Even Alice was horrified because he had wasted candy on a pig, and his blouse was ruined. It could be patched, but the patch would show. I don't care, Almanzo said. He was glad it was a whole week before Mother would know. That day they made ice cream again and they ate the last cake. Alice said she knew how to make a pound cake. She said she'd make one. And then she was going to go sit in the parlor. Amonzo thought that wouldn't be any fun, but Eliza Jane said, you'll do no such thing, Alice. You know very well the parlor's just for company. It was not Eliza Jane's parlor, and Mother hadn't said she couldn't sit in it. Amonzo thought that Alice could sit in the parlor if she wanted to. That afternoon, he came into the kitchen to see if the pound cake was done. Alice was taking it out of the oven. It smelled so good that he broke a little piece off the corner. Then Alice cut a slice to hide the broken place. And then they ate two more slices with the last of the ice cream. I can make more ice cream, Alice said. Eliza Jane was upstairs. And Almanzo said, let's go into the parlor. They tiptoed in without making a sound. The light was dim because the blinds were down, but the parlor was beautiful. The wallpaper was white and gold, and the carpet was of Mother's best weaving, almost too fine to step on. The center table was marble-topped, and it held the tall parlor lamp, all white gold china and pink painted roses. Beside it lay the photograph album with covers of red velvet and Mother of Pearl. All around the walls stood solemn horsehair chairs, and George Washington's picture looked sternly from his frame between the windows. Alice hitched up her hoops behind and sat on the sofa. The slippery hair cloth slid her right off onto the floor. She didn't dare laugh out loud for fear Eliza Jane would hear. She sat on the sofa again and slid off again. Then Almanza slid off a chair. When company came, they had to sit in the parlor. They kept themselves on the slippery chairs by pushing their toes against the floor but now they could let go and slide. They slid off the sofa and the chairs till Alice was giggling so hard they didn't dare slide anymore. Then they looked at the shells and the core on the little china figures on the whatnot. They didn't touch anything. They looked till they heard Eliza Jane coming downstairs and then they ran tiptoe out of the parlor and shut the door without a sound. Eliza Jane didn't catch them. It seemed that a week would last forever, but suddenly it was gone. One morning at breakfast, Eliza Jane said, father and mother will be here tomorrow. They all stopped eating. The garden had not been weeded. The peas and beans had not been picked, so the vines were ripening too soon. The hen house had not been whitewashed. This house is a sight, Eliza Jane said, and we must churn today. But what am I going to tell Mother? The sugar is all gone. Nobody ate anymore. They looked into the sugar barrel, and they could see the bottom of it. Only Alice tried to be cheerful. We must hope for the best, she said, like Mother. There's some sugar left. Mother said, don't eat all the sugar, and we didn't. There's some around the edges. 
This was only the beginning of that awful day. They all went to work as hard as they could. Royal and Almanza hold the garden. They whitewashed the hen house. They cleaned the cow's stalls and swept the south barn floor. The girls were sweeping and scrubbing in the house. Eliza Jane made Almanza churn till the butter came, and her hands flew while she washed and salted and packed it in the tub. There was only bread and butter and jam for dinner, though Almanza was starved. Now, Almanza, you polish the heater, Eliza Jane said. He hated to polish stoves, but he hoped Eliza Jane would not tell that he had wasted candy on his pig. He went to work with the stove blacking and the brush. Eliza Jane was hurrying and nagging. Be careful you don't spill the polish, she said, busily dusting. Almanzo guessed he knew enough not to spill the stove polish, but he didn't say anything. Use less water, Almanzo, and mercy, rub harder than that. He didn't say anything. Eliza Jane went into the parlor to dust it. She called, Almanzo, that stove done now? No, said Almanzo. Goodness, don't dawdle so. Almanzo muttered, whose boss are you? Eliza Jane asked, what'd you say? Nothing, Almanzo said. Eliza Jane came to the door. You did so say something. Amonzo straightened up and shouted, I say, whose boss are you? Eliza Jane gasped. Then she cried out, You just wait, Amonzo James Wilder. You just wait till I tell Mut. Amonzo didn't mean to throw the blacking brush. It flew right out of his hand. It sailed past Eliza Jane's head. Smack, it hit the parlor wall. A great splash and smear of blacking appeared on the white and gold wallpaper. Alice screamed. Almanzo turned around and ran all the way to the barn. He climbed into the hay mow and crawled far back into the hay. He did not cry, but he would have cried if he hadn't been almost 10 years old. Mother would come home and find that he had ruined her beautiful parlor. Father would take him to the woodshed and whip him with a black snake whip. He didn't want ever to come out of the hay mow. He wished he could stay there forever. After a long while, Royal came into the hay mow and called him. He crawled out of the hay, and he saw that Royal knew. Manny, you'll get an awful whipping, Royal said. Royal was sorry, but he couldn't do anything. They both knew that Almanzo deserved whipping, and there was no way to keep Father from knowing it. So Almanzo said, I don't care. He helped do the chores, and he ate supper. He wasn't hungry, but he ate to show Eliza Jane that he didn't care. Then he went to bed. The parlor door was shut, but he knew how the black splotch looked on the white and gold wall. Next day, Father and Mother came driving into the yard. Amonzo had to go out and meet them with the others. Alice whispered to him, don't feel bad, maybe they won't care. But she looked anxious too. Father said cheerfully, well, here we are, been getting along all right? Yes, Father, Royal answered. Amonzo didn't go help unhitch the driving horses. He stayed in the house. Mother hurried about, looking at everything while she untied her bonnet sp strings. I declare, Eliza, Jane, and Alice, she said, you've kept the house as well as I've done myself. Mother? Alice said in a small voice, Mother, well, child, what is it? Uh, Mother, Alice said bravely, you told us not to eat all the sugar. Mother, we, we ate almost all of it. Mother laughed, you've all been so good, she said, I won't scold about the sugar. She did not know that the black splotch was on the parlor wall. The parlor door was shut. She did not know it that day, nor all the next day. Amonzo could hardly choke down his food at mealtimes, and Mother worried. She took him into the pantry and made him swallow a big spoonful of horrible black medicine she had made from roots and herbs. He did not want her to know about the black splotch, and yet he wished she did know. When the worst was over, he could stop dreading it. That second evening, they heard a buggy driving into the yard. Mr. and Mrs. Webb were in it. Father and Mother went out to meet them, and in a minute, they all came into the dining room. Amonzo heard Mother saying, come right into the parlor. He couldn't move. He could not speak. This was worse than anything he had thought of. Mother was so proud of her beautiful parlor. She was so proud of keeping it always nice. She didn't know he had ruined it, and now she was taking company in. They would see that big black splotch on the wall. Mother opened the parlor door and went in. Mrs. Webb went in, and Mr. Webb and Father. Amonzo saw only their backs, but he heard the window shades going up. He saw that the parlor was full of light. It seemed to him a long time before anybody said anything. Then Mother said, take this big chair, Mr. Webb, and make yourself comfortable. Sit right here on the sofa, Mrs. Webb. Alice, Almanzo couldn't believe his ears. Mrs. Webb said, you have such a beautiful parlor, I declare it's almost too fine to sit in. Now Almanzo could see where the blacking brush had hit the wall, and he could not believe his eyes. The wallpaper was pure white and gold. There was no black splotch. Mother caught sight of him and said, come in, Almanzo. Almanzo went in. He sat up straight on a haircloth chair and pushed his toes against the floor to keep from sliding off. Father and mother were telling about all about the visit to Uncle Andrew's. There was no black splotch anywhere on the wall. Didn't you worry leaving the children alone here and you so far away, Mrs. Webb asked. No, mother said proudly. I knew the children would take care of everything as well as if James and I were at home. 
Amonzo minded his manners and did not say a word. Next day, when no one was looking, he stole into the parlor. He looked carefully at the place where the black splotch had been. The wallpaper was patched. The patch had been cut out carefully all around the gold scrolls, and the pattern was fitted perfectly, and the edges of the patch scraped so thin that he could hardly find them. He waited until he could speak to Eliza Jane alone, and then he asked, Eliza Jane, did you patch the parlor wallpaper for me? Yes, she said. I got the scraps of wallpaper that were saved in the attic and cut out the patch and put it on with flower paste. Almanza said gruffly, I'm sorry I threw that brush at you. Honest, I didn't mean to, Eliza Jane. I guess I was aggravating, she said, but I didn't mean to be. You're the only little brother I've got. Almanzo had never known before how much he liked Eliza Jane. <laughs> they never, never told about the black splotch on the parlor wall, and Mother never knew. <laughs> I've known Jim Weir for several years, and he's always found a way to give service to the community of Missoula. He's been on several boards, including the Missoula Public Library Board, and uh, he works at KUFM. You may recognize his voice when he begins. And Matthew Lyon is a good storyteller, too, and a wonderful musician. And I, I think you're probably going to introduce your harp. Is that right? All right. Uh, Matthew Lyon and Jim Weir. story comes from a different uh, culture and from a very long time ago. Uh, this is a long, long tradition of uh, Scottish uh, storytelling, which goes back a long, long, long number of years. And the stories were <clears throat> first uh, brought together by people called Shanakis, which is Gaelic for storyteller, if you like. And it wasn't until about the 1600s that they became itinerant. They could move uh, from place to place. And in the true Celtic tradition, uh, all over the Celtic world, most storytellers either had a harp of their own or they had someone whom they traveled with uh, who had a harp because uh, they were kind of storytellers, musicians, entertainers, gossip columnists, newsmakers, uh, and rumor mongers, among other things. Uh, they didn't steal, as far as I know, but uh, they may have done. But uh, my accompanist, Matthew, uh, has what is called a clarsach, which is a small harp in uh, the Celtic tradition. And I would like uh, Matthew to uh, introduce you to the harp and tell you a little bit more about it. Well, Jim, so this is a clarsach. And it is, um, this one has 26 strings. I built it about a year ago. So I'm about a year into playing harp right now, which is sort of a shaky kind of thing. I play fiddle as well, but it's uh, quite a few more strings. This is the kind of harp you'd find in Scotland and in Ireland probably a, a, from a thousand years all the way up to two or three hundred years ago when it finally died out and it's just recently been revived. It's metal strung as opposed to the nylon strings of modern harps. Nylon strings of modern harps. Now, the, tale, uh, the, the title of the uh, story that I'm going to read comes from a book by, called Heather and Broom by Shorsley Cleodis. And if you're interested in tales from Scotland, this is an excellent author, and they are available in the public library here. And the, the, some of them are really excellent. And the tale, the name of the tale is called The Gay Goshawk. Now, I must explain that uh, the word gay has taken on another meaning in our civilization, but uh, the original uh, meaning of gay was lighthearted and happy. And so this is really what uh, the title says, the happy goshawk, which is a kind of kestrel, if, if you like. And the story is about a young English lady who tries to marry a Scottish laird, and it's about their unrequited love and how it ends 
Well, you'll find out how it ends. It's called The Gay Goshawk. There once was a young English lady of very high degree. She had a father and seven brothers and a stepmother whom her father had married but lately. The father and her seven brothers loved her well enough, but the stepmother had no liking for her, being envious because the lady was young and good and beautiful, and the stepmother was none of the three. So, the poor English lady was not happy at home, for her stepmother lost no chance of making sure that she wouldn't be. Well, there came a time when the English king called together all his court. The young lady was there too with all her family. And there she met a gay Scottish laird who was so gentle and kind that she loved him without half trying, and he loved her the same. Well, since they loved him, and she loved him, and he loved her, they plighted their troth and promised to wed. And as a pledge of love, he gave her a gold ring from his finger, and she gave him a blue silken bow from her dress, tied in a true love knot. The Scottish laird went to her father to ask for the lady's hand in marriage, but the father they wouldn't have it at all. For he and her seven brothers had planned to marry her off to an English lord who was very wealthy and who also had the ear of this English king ready to listen to whatever he liked to say. The Scottish laird had plenty of gold and a house and land and he had a thousand good men of his clan to serve him in his need. But the lady's father scorned the Scots as a proud, wild, stiff-necked race and he told the laird he'd have none of him to be his son-in-law. And then the stepmother said that the lovers would be meeting, since they were at the king's court together. So to prevent it, her father carried her off to his own castle far away. And after she had gone, the Scottish laird had no pleasure at the king's court. So he packed up and went back to his own castle in the north. The only thing that pleased him there was a gay goshawk that he had. He, gross, he grew so fond of it, for it sang to him merrily when he was sad. And it went with him wherever he went, and was his faithful companion. It would perch on his knee when he sat, or sit by his plate when he ate, or ride on his wrist as he went about his lands. It was a very intelligent bird, and had learned to know the laird so well that it understood all that he said to it. But nothing could comfort the laird for the loss of his love. He grew as wan and pale in his castle as the lady did in hers. At last, the laird sat down and wrote a letter to his love, and in it he told her to come to him soon or he would surely die. And he told the goshawk that he must carry the letter to England and give it to the young English lady. Though you've never laid eyes upon her, he said to the goshawk, you know her from all the rest, for she is the fairest lady in all the length and breadth of the land. Then the laird told the bird the way he was to go to find the lady's father's castle. And when the goshawk got there, he was to sit in the birch tree that stood by the lady's door and when the lady came out with her maidens to go to church, then he should sing so that the lady would notice him. And if she stopped and came to the tree, the goshawk could give her the letter. The laird hung the true love knot the lady had given him about the goshawk's neck so she'd know who was sending him to her. And the bird took the letter in its beak and stretched its wings out wide off it flew to the English castle. 
Now, when the goshawk came to the castle of the English lady's father, he sat himself down upon a branch of the birch tree by the lady's bower that the laird had told him about. And the letter he tucked under his wing to hide it away. By and by, out comes the lady to church with all her maidens along with her. And right merrily did the goshawk sing. And the lady turned her head and looked back at him. And when she saw the glue true lover's knot about the bird's neck, she knew who had sent him there. So she told her maidens to be walking on, and she'd come to them a little later. So off they went without her, and never turned back to look at her. And back she went to the gay goshawk, and bade him sing again. And first he sang a merry song. And then he sang a sad one. And then he took the letter from under his wing and gave it to the fair English lady, for he knew that she was the one his master had told him about. The lady unfolded the letter and began to read it. First, she turned pale as a white rose. And then, as she read, she turned rosy as a red one. And when she finished, she read it all again. And then she wrote a letter to tell the laird to bake his bridal bread and brew his bridal ale because before either of them had a chance to grow stale, she had been at St. Mary's Church to meet him. The goshawk took the letter and off and away he flew. And he never stopped for a bite, nor for supper till he laid the letter safe in the hand of the young, young Scottish laird. Now, when the bird was gone, the lady sat long to think what she was to do. And then she rose and went up to her bedchamber and laid herself down on her bed. Her maidens came seeking her, as for it troubled them that she had not come to them and to the church, and they found her lying there. Go fetch my father quickly, she said, before I feel ill. And I think I'm about to die. The maidens ran for her father and told them what she had said. And he came and stood at her bedside and she looked at him. Father, she said, before I die, will you grant me one wish? Do not ask for your Scottish laird, her father said with a frown. Anything else I will promise you, whatever it may be, but rather than see you wedded to yon proud Scottish laird, I'd see you lying dead. Well then, said the lady, should I die, will you give me your promise true that my seven brothers shall carry me to Scotland to be buried? And when they come to the first church, will you let them stop and have the mass sung over me? And when they come to the second church, let them have the church bells tolled for me. But when they come to St. Mary's Church, they must set me down in the churchyard and wait there till the night. Well, her father promised all that she asked, and then he went away. And in the dead of the night, when all the castle were asleep, and her old nurse dozing by the fire. The lady got up from her bed, mixed herself a sleeping draught, and when it was mixed, she drank it down and then slipped back into her bed. At the dawn of day, the old nurse awoke, and there was her fair young lady lying so still and white that anyone would be sure she was dead. And she roused all the castle and told them that the lady had died in her sleep. And her father came and her seven brothers came and they all stood grieving about the lady's bed. And then came her stepmother and stood looking at her. Yeah, we'll make sure she is dead, said the stepmother. And first, she sent for a sharp silver pin when it was brought to her, she took it in her hand and stuck it into the lady's white arm. But the lady never blinked, 
are moved when the pin went in. And then the stepmother sent for a pan of hot boiling wax, and when it came, she dropped three drops of it on the lady's white breast. But the lady did not sigh, nor did she flinch, but she lay there with no sign of life. Then her seven brothers made a beer, and they made it all of oaken boughs, and they covered it over with a silver cloth as was fitting for a lady of such high degree. And her maidens took white velvet and made her a white velvet cap and a white velvet coverlet for her beer. And with every stitch they took, they sewed on a little silver bell. Now when all was ready, her maidens washed and dressed her, and they combed her long golden hair, and they took her from her bed and laid her upon the silver bier, and upon her head they set the velvet cap, and they lay the velvet coverlet over her. Then all her seven brothers took up the bier, and all the little silver bells rang sweetly as they carried her away to Scotland. When they came to the first church, the seven brothers set the beer down, and there they had the mass sung over her. At the second church, they stopped again, and there her seven brothers had the church bells rung for her. But at the third Scottish church was St. Mary's Church. The seven brothers carried the beer into the churchyard, for there they were to wait until the night. But when they came in up, sprang a hundred spearmen, and out from the midst of them stepped the young Scottish laird, and he bade the seven brothers to set down the lady's beer that he might look upon her face. And he took her by the hand, and up she rose at once and smiled upon him lovingly. And she set herself among the spearmen, with her true love by her side and the little silver bells upon her velvet chap chimed merrily together all the while. Go home, my seven brothers, go home, she said, for you fetch me to where I want to be. And then her seven brothers said as they turned to go, shame to you that you left your father to grieve at home because he thought you were dead. Take my love to my father, she told them, though he said he'd rather I were lying dead than married to my Scottish laird. But I send no love to my cruel stepmother for the sharp silver pins she stuck with me and hot boiling wax she burned me with, for to her I wish nothing but woe. And then she rode off gaily beside her Scottish laird, and the next day they were wed. And wherever they went, there went the goshawk too, that had brought them together when they were parted. And happy they were, for all their troubles, like this story, had come to an end. When I saw that uh, Deirdre McNamer's name was on the list of the 12 stars who were going to read to you tonight, I was very happy. I was hoping that she would read to us from her novel, Rima in the Weeds, but I see that she is not, so you're going to have to get that book yourself and read it, either in the library or the bookstore. She has chosen uh, another writer I greatly enjoy, Alice Monroe. Thank you, Marcia. I'm going to um, finish up the evening with a very brief uh, excerpt from a story by Alice Monroe. For those of you who don't, aren't familiar with her, she's a, about a 60-year-old Canadian writer who, has, uh, who grew up in rural eastern Canada and has, um, over the last oh, couple decades, 
become more and more well known uh, in this country as well. She's, uh, she has, I think, a, a really uncanny ability to capture the uh, small, pivotal moments that make a difference in our lives and get them absolutely right. She's, she's emotionally precise, and that's what I admire the most about her, although she also has a kind of a boldness, a combination of boldness and delicacy in her writing um, that I like as well. Another uh, American writer, Cynthia Ozick, says Monroe calls her our Chekhov and uh, says she's going to outlast most of her contemporaries. So if you're not familiar with her, I urge you to pick up some of her collections of stories. Uh, the one I'll read from, I'm not sure of the pronunciation. I think it's Minnesatung, which is a river in eastern Canada. And it's from a collection, her most recent collection, called uh, Friend of My Youth. This story has a is about a woman named Almeida Roth who lives in a small eastern Canadian town in the late 1800s. Uh, Almeida is a spinster and a poetess. She has some interest in a man named Jarvis Poulter who lives down the street from her and is a, su a successful um, businessman. His main business is a salt mine that he uh, discovered and runs. The story has an interesting point of view. It's told by a woman in our time who is poring over old newspapers from this little Canadian town and trying to fill in the gaps um, in her own mind about what Almeida Roth's life might have been. And this section opens with a little quote from the Vidette, which is the gossipy little small town paper uh, that she's poring over. <coughs> Among the couples strolling home from church on a recent sunny Sabbath morning, we noted a certain salty gentleman and literary lady, not perhaps in their first youth, but by no means blighted by the frosts of age. May we surmise? This kind of thing pops up in the vidette all the time. May they surmise, and is this courting? Almeida Roth has a bit of money which her father left her, and she has her house. She is not too old to have a couple of children. She is a good enough housekeeper with the tendency toward fancy iced cakes and decorated tarts that is seen fairly often in old maids. Honorable mention at the fall fair. There is nothing wrong with her looks, and naturally she is in better shape than most married women of her age, not having been loaded down with work and children. But why was she passed over in her earlier, more marriageable years, in a place that needs women to be partnered and fruitful? She was a rather gloomy girl. That may have been the trouble. The deaths of her brother and sister, and then of her mother, who lost her reason, in fact, a year before she died, and lay in her bed talking nonsense, those weighed on her, so she was not lively company. And all that reading and poetry, it seemed more of a drawback, a barrier, an obsession in the young girl than in the middle-aged woman who needed something, after all, to fill her time. Anyway, it's five years since her book of poetry was published, so perhaps she has got over that. Perhaps it was her proud, bookish father encouraging her. Everyone takes it for granted that Al Almeida Roth is thinking of Jarvis Poulter as a husband and would say yes if he asked her. And she is thinking of him. She doesn't want to get her hopes up too much. She doesn't want to make a fool of herself. She would like a signal. If he attended church on Sunday evenings, there would be a chance during some months of the year, to walk home after dark. He would carry a lantern. There is, as yet, no street lighting in town. He would swing the lantern to light the way in front of the ladies' feet and observe their narrow and delicate shape. He might catch her arm as they step off the boardwalk. But he does not go to church at night, nor does he call for her and walk with her to church on Sunday mornings. That would be a declaration. 
He walks her home past his gate as far as hers. He lifts his hat then and leaves her. He does not invite him to, she, does, she does not invite him to come in. A woman living alone could never do such a thing. As soon as a man and woman of almost any age are alone together within four walls, it is assumed that anything may happen. Spontaneous combustion, instant fornication, an attack of passion, brood instinct, triumph of the senses. What possibilities men and women must see in each other to infer such dangers? Or, believing in the dangers, how often they must think about the possibilities. When they walk side by side, she can smell his shaving soap, the barber's oil, his pipe tobacco, the wool and linen and leather smell of his manly clothes. The correct, orderly, heavy clothes are like those she used to brush and starch and iron for her father. She misses that job, her father's appreciation, his dark, kind authority. Jarvis Poulter's garments, his smell, his movements, all cause the skin on the side of her body next to him to tingle hopefully, and a meek shiver raises the hairs on her arms. Is this to be taken as a sign of love? She thinks of him coming into her, their bedroom in his long underwear and his hat. She knows this outfit is ridiculous, but in her mind, he does not look so. He has the solemn effrontery of a figure in a dream. He comes into the room and lies down on the bed beside her, preparing to take her in his arms. Surely he removes his hat. She doesn't know, for at this point, a fit of welcome and submission overtakes her, a buried gasp. He would be her husband. One thing she has noticed about married women and that is how many of them have to go about creating their husbands. They have to start ascribing preferences, opinions, dictatorial ways. Oh yes, they say, my husband is very particular. He won't touch turnips. He won't eat fried meat, or he will only eat fried meat. He likes me to wear blue, brown, all the time. He can't stand organ music. He hates to see a woman go out bareheaded. He would kill me if I took one puff of tobacco. This way, bewildered, sidelong looking men are made over, made into husbands, heads of households. Almeida Roth cannot imagine herself doing that. She wants a man who doesn't have to be made, who is firm already and determined and mysterious to her. She does not look for companionship. Men, except for her father, seem to her deprived in some way, incurious. No doubt that is necessary, so that they will do what they have to do. Would she herself, knowing that there was salt in the earth, discover how to get it out and sell it? Not likely. She would be thinking about the ancient sea. That kind of speculation is what Jarvis Poulter has, quite properly, no time for. <laughs> Well, thank you, readers, and thank you, listeners and viewers. This has been the Night of a Thousand Stars, the Great American Read Aloud, the second annual here at this library. It's brought to you by the Missoula Public Library and Literacy Volunteers of America, Missoula, and has been broadcast on Missoula Community Access Television. Good night.